Kishore, you published a book not, not so long ago with the very provocative title, Has the West Lost It? <laughs> so here's Actually, my question. I brought a copy here. <laughs> so here's my question. Has the West lost it when you listen to this discussion? Um, or, hmm. to put it a little more, I, I guess, intelligently, uh, what role do you see as, a, as, as looking at NATO and our region from the outside, from an Asian perspective, hmm. what role do you see for the transatlantic alliance in, a, in the evolving international system, in this new landscape of uh, quote unquote great power competition, et cetera, et cetera. Kishore, well, try I, to be I, I brief. Know, I, know, I know you're watching the clock. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'll make uh, three very quick mm -hmm. uh, points to answer your question uh, directly. The first point I want to make, and it's an important point, I think from the point of view of the rest of the world, at a time when everything is changing, right? We are entering a new era of world history. And just to give you a, how, how dramatic the change is, you had 200 years of Western domination of world history. Today, in PPP terms, the number one economy is China, number two is the United States, number three is India, number four is Japan. Not one European country in the top four. It's a different world. So with everything changing, it's good to have some pillars of stability in the world, right? And since the West created, in many ways, the global architecture post-1945, which is still, I think, working and holding the world together, and I spent 10 years as ambassador to the UN, so I know that this, these, many of these global multilateral institutions work, and they rest on the transatlantic alliance as the substructure of the global uh, governance architecture. So, the rest of the world doesn't want to see this transatlantic alliance being shaken. It's good if it stays together. But my second point at the same time is that at the end of the day, an alliance is about threats. Now, threats, as you know, are, we are talking about geopolitical threats. The word geopolitical means geography political. Now, the geography of Europe is very different from the geography of the United States or North America. And the number one threat that Europe is going to face in the 21st century is not the number one threat that America is going to face in the 21st century. And to put it very bluntly, what, the, what Europe is going to face, in 1950, Europe's population was twice that of Africa's. Today, Africa's population is twice that of Europe's. By 2100, it's going to be 10 times the size of Europe. I guarantee you, you've already seen a few, what a few boats have done, right? <laughs> they have distorted the whole political process in Europe. You've had these populist parties coming in because people are frightened of these boats coming. And the leaders haven't paid attention to the people's fears. The peoples are not worried about Russian tanks coming tomorrow. They're more worried about the African migrants coming. And here, Secretary of State John Kerry is absolutely right. When he talks about the young P2 billion people with a smartphone, more and more of them are going to come. And how do you keep them out? So that brings me to my third point. You've got to, de you've got to develop Africa economically. There's only one solution. And who's the number one potential partner for Europe for the economic development of Africa? Who's the number one investor in Africa today? It's China. So it's quite, it would be quite natural if you look at geography, political, geopolitical uh, interests, there's a convergence of interests within Europe and China to develop Africa economically and hold back the boat people. But I guarantee you, and that's what my next book is about, <laughs> in the next 10 years, there will be a spike in US-China rivalry. No number one power gives up its number one power that easily. And China's economy, in nominal market terms, will become number one in 10 to 15 years. There will be a tremendous Sino-American geopolitical struggle coming. And then, where does Europe stand? Does it look after its own geographic interests and work with China and Africa? Or does it work with the United States to counterbalance China and sacrifice its interests? Now, these are hard questions. There are no easy answers. But what I would recommend to the Transatlantic Alliance, since we want you to continue, we want you to remain strong, please have some very hard-headed 
discussions among yourself about how you keep this transatlantic alliance strong in a 21st century which is completely different from the 20th century.